One, two, three, four, 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 one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, 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 one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four.
You asked for help? That's me. Harry Edward Linus Pleasington. But you can call me Help for short. Hi, Mom. Miriam, how nice to see you. Harry, nice of you to come. It's been a long time. Good to see you again. It's good to see you too, Miriam. And I'm delighted to meet your daughter. I hope you can do as much for her as you did for me and my flute. Well, it's my job. It's what I love to do. You two work hard. Call me if you need me. I'll be right downstairs. Your mom caught me at the perfect time. I just finished teaching the mayor's daughter, and tonight I've got a gig with... You play with them? They're the hottest band around. Taught them everything they know, and now it's your turn. In the time we have today, I'll teach you some basics. We'll learn proper piano posture, the names of the white keys, how to play some chords. You'll even learn some new songs. How's that sound? Great. I could really use some... Help? <laughs> This is a nice keyboard. What made you choose this one? I did a lot of research and shared it with my parents. Here, I'll show you. An upright piano costs more and takes up more space. Plus, it's hard to move. And a baby grand, well, that's just bigger and heavier and more expensive than an upright. I found out about a lot of different kinds of electric keyboards, but for now, Mom, Dad, and I all agree that I don't really need one with a lot of fancy things on it. You've got some smart parents, Jill. No doubt about that. I just hope I'm as smart as they are. All I want to do is play like him. But it just seems like there's not much that I do know and too much that I don't. He's great, isn't he? We haven't talked in a while, but he sure seems to have mastered everything he learned from me. You taught him? <laughs> you can teach me too? One step at a time, Jill. One step at a time. You know, it may sound funny, but learning to play the keyboard is a bit like building a swimming pool. A swimming pool? Right. Let me show you. Say this hole is everything you don't know about playing the keyboard. All you have to do is take some knowledge, put in a whole lot of practice, and before you know it, you'll be doing swimmingly. Let's get started, shall we? Okay. First, let's learn to sit at the keyboard. For that, I think we need a demonstration. Hey, George, how are you? Help! Is that you? How are you, man? Great! It's good to see you again. You too! Long time! This is Jill. She's my new student. Do you have time to give us a hand? Jill, hey! How's it going? Fine. Could you jam a little for us? Sure thing! See how he stands at his keyboard? Yeah, that's what I was trying to do. So, how does that feel? It's hard being all hunched over like this, but I'm sure I'll get used to it. Well, why don't you try sitting down again? It's a good place to start. Then when you have more experience, you can play standing on your feet or your hands or even your head if you want to. <laughs> that sounds like fun. Now I'll give you the one, two, threes of proper playing position. Feet flat on the floor. Sit up straight. Sort of close to the edge of your seat. And relax your shoulders. And keep your arms parallel to the ground and your elbows just a little higher than the keyboard. That's right, and curved fingers on the keys. Good. Wow, that feels pretty good. Good. Let's move on to the keys. I counted them. There are 88. Well, that's pretty typical. A piano usually has 88 too, although in keyboards you can have different sizes like 49, 61, or even 76. Now, have you counted how many pedals you have? There's only one. Right, that's also typical for keyboards. A piano has three pedals. Now, why don't you play the keys, just the white keys, starting at the left, and go all the way up as far as you'd like to go. Good. What did you notice? The sound gets higher as I move up the keyboard. Right. Here's something fun to do. You can take your hand and glide it over all the keys from one direction to the other and listen. That's called a glissando, or gliss for short. It's easy to do. It sounds pretty nice. <laughs> and that's just the beginning of what you're going to learn. Next, I want to touch on three words that'll come in handy. Melody, harmony, rhythm. Think of a band, any band. If there's only one singer, they usually sing the melody, which is the most recognizable part of the song. 
Harmony is all the notes being played by any instrument or another singer. Harmony makes the melody more full and interesting, like with an orchestra. Rhythm is the beat of the song. You can find the rhythm by tapping along to the music. Let's give it a try. Rhythm is usually set by the drums, and the bass can help with rhythm. And since the bass can play actual notes, it can add harmony. So let me see if I've got this straight. Rhythm is the beat, melody is the tune, and harmony is what makes the tune sound more interesting. That sounds about right. Now let's listen to another piece of music and count out the beats that we hear. Most popular music is counted in groups of four, called measures. So we'll count like this. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. You ready to give it a try? Sure am. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Some songs are counted in groups of three, some in groups of six, and many other combinations, which we won't cover in this exercise. If you're having trouble finding the beat, just keep trying different songs, and eventually you'll find one that works. But once you've found the beat, it's like riding a bike. You'll never forget. <laughs> Although even experts have to keep practicing. <laughs> now next, I'm going to tell you about octaves and notes. Octa what? <laughs> I'll have George explain. Hey, George, can you tell Jill what an octave is? The root of the word octave comes from the Latin octavo, meaning eight. The interval between tone one of the scale and tone eight of the scale is one octave. This is middle C, because it's a C and it's in the middle of the keyboard. This is also a C, but it is one octave lower. You know it. One thing about the note C is that there's a whole bunch of them on the keyboard. You can always find them by looking for all the groups of the two black keys together, like right here. Can you show me where some of the other C's are on the keyboard? Um. Right. Now, if you move one white key to the right of the note C, that's the note D. You can find it the same way you found the C, by looking for all of the groups of the two black keys together. How about showing me some of the D notes on your keyboard? Here and here. That's great. And the next note is the note E. Can you show me where the other E's are on the keyboard? Right. Now, can you guess what note comes next? It would have to be the note F. That's right. And to find it, you look for the group of three black keys together. Like this? That's right. This would be F here. And I bet this note is the note G. Right. So what do you think the next note is? H? Actually, we start back again at A. So what's this note? Don't you know your alphabet help? <laughs> OK, you got me. This would have to be... A B. <laughs> Very good. Now that we've learned all of the names of the notes on the keyboard, hold up your hands and we'll number your fingers to make it easy for you to remember what finger goes where. We'll call the thumbs number one. That would mean my index fingers are number two. Right, so numbering the rest of your fingers is a snap. Using your right hand, put your first finger on the note C and let the rest of your fingers fall on the notes next to C, one finger per key. Now you can easily reach the notes C, D, E, F, and G. This is called the C position. Go ahead, give it a try. C, D, E, F, G. That was great. You did it just right. Your fingers were lying on the keys, and you just pressed down on the key that you want without lifting your finger up. The rest of the fingers just rest until it's their turn. OK, now remember when we were counting in groups of four? Well, take a look at this. 
The numbers 1 to 4 are the beats in the measure. You play the note written over each number. If you see an arrow next to a note, that means you hold that note and let it ring out until the next note. So you ready to give it a try? Yes. Okay, here you go. That was great, Jill. You ready for something a little harder? Sure am. Okay, remember to hold a note for as many beats as the arrow indicates. That was fun. If you liked that, then you've got to try this one. But first, you better put these things on. What's this for? <laughs> You'll see. <laughs> Ready to play? Yep. the joke help. That was Jingle Bells. Hey, I played a real song, Jingle Bells. Boy, that's neat. Did you know that Jingle Bells was your mom's first song on the flute, too? Maybe we can play a duet. <laughs> Does she still play? Every day. She calls it practice, but I figure she's so good by now, she doesn't really need to practice anymore. Even professional musicians practice every day. In fact, that's something you'd start to think about. How to make daily practice automatic, and what time of day you'd like to do it. We'll talk more about that later. For now, let's get that left hand to work. Sure thing. Here's what you do. Find middle C and go down until you find the next C to the left. It'll be in the next group of two black keys. Place your fifth finger on this C. Let the rest of your fingers fall on the white keys next to C. You should have all five fingers on the keys with one key under each finger. Your left hand is now in C position. Your fingers should be on notes D, E, F, and G. Good work, Jill. Can you practice playing each of these notes one at a time? C, D, E, F, G. Way to go. Now here's a little something to warm up your left hand. Very nice job, Jill. Now try this. Nice going. Now this ought to sound familiar to you. Give it a try. We interrupt this program so that you can practice Jingle Bells. When you're finished, hit the play button. 
Way to go, Jill. Now we're going to go on to a little ditty written by a rather famous fellow, Ludwig van Beethoven. It's called Ode to Joy, and you already know all the notes in it, so it should be fun for you to play. First time through, play it with just your right hand. Then the second time through, just your left hand. And on the third time around, play it with both hands together. You think you can do that? I'd like to try. Good. And don't be afraid if you make a mistake. That's how you learn. Just stop, correct it, and go on. Here I go. That's right. That was really good, Jill. You ready to give both hands a try? I can hardly wait. We interrupt this program so that you can pause to practice playing Ode to Joy. I really like that song. Well, you did great, Jill. Really fine job. Thanks, Help. It's fun playing like this. You ready to learn about chords? Let's do it. Hey, George, can you play us a few chords? Sure thing. Here goes. He's good. I'd like to be that good. Well, you've shown a real flair for the keyboard. All you have to do is practice, 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 and it'll happen for sure. Well, if playing is this much fun, practicing should be easy. I'll just do it every day, like I brush my teeth or set the table for dinner or play catch with Dad. That's great, because a little bit of practice every day adds up to a whole lot of skill. You ready to move on? Okay. Great. Now, here's a question for you. Can you tell me the difference between the sound of a single note And the sound of a chord? More full. The chord sounds more full. Right. Remember when we were talking about harmony earlier? That's basically what a chord is. Individual notes that harmonize together when they're played at once. It's like the difference between one voice singing alone Hello. or having a duet. That's two people singing. Or a trio. That's three people. Sure, I'll be happy to show you. Now, you can play small chords with only two notes, and you can play chords with the left hand and the right hand. But for now, I'm going to show you how to play a three-note chord with your right hand and add one more note with your left hand, which makes four notes all together. Let's look at our first chord. The C chord is made up of three notes, C, E, and G. Put your right hand in C position and play each of these notes one at a time. Right. Now play all these notes at the same time. That's how you play a C chord. Show me another. The G chord. The G chord is made up of three notes, G, B, and D. 
The finger pattern played with the C chord, first finger, third finger, fifth finger, is exactly like the finger pattern you use for the G chord. So move your right hand out of C position and place your first finger on the note G. And let the rest of your fingers fall on the keys just as you would do in a C position. Play the note G with your first finger, B with your third finger, and D with your fifth finger. Now play all these notes at the same time. That's G. We're going to take a little detour from playing chords to reading them. Chords can be written out on a chart, and when they are, instead of numbers below each chord, we'll put slashes. They're equal to the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4 that we've been working with. By now, you should be used to counting out loud. Start counting in your head without the numbers below each chord. Another reason slashes are used instead of numbers is so we don't confuse chords with notes. For our purposes, think of it like this. When you see numbers, play notes. When you see slashes, play chords. So numbers mean notes like this. And slashes mean chords. You got it. Ready for an exercise? I'm ready. Try this. That was great. You remembered that slashes meant chords, and that's what you played. Now you're ready to add the left hand? Try me. OK. You're going to add one more note to these chords with the left hand. It's called the root note. And the root note is simply the same note as the name of the chord. So with a C chord, the root note would be the note C, one octave down. So for the C chord, which I'd play like this, I'd play the root of the C chord, which is this. You got it, Jill. Now, can you show me a G chord with the root note? Very good. And notice that you played the root note of the C chord with the fifth finger of your left hand and the root note of the G chord with the first finger of your left hand. So you didn't have to change your hand position at all. You're right. That's because you're only playing one note with the left hand. You ready to try an exercise? Sure. We interrupt this program so that you can practice what you just learned. That was great, Jill. You're really getting the hang of this. Now I've got a new chord for you. You ready for it? Which one are you going to show me now? It's the F chord, and it's one of my favorites. The F chord is made up of three notes, F, A, and C. To play this chord, you move your right hand out of C position and use your first finger to play the note F. Let the rest of your fingers fall on the keys just as they would for the C position. So your third finger will play the note A, and your fifth finger will play the note C. Try them all together. So my first finger is over the note F, my third finger is over the note A, and my fifth finger is over the note C. Like this. Good. And here's a little something to remember. If you're moving your right hand from the G chord, all you have to do is move all of your fingers down one key. Just like that. Now, I got another exercise for you. You ready to give it a try? Ready. Good. And what would you do to add the root note with your left hand? I think I'd just play the F note one octave down with the second finger of my left hand. Exactly right. That's really super, Jill. Now here's another exercise for your left hand. That was really well done. You've been working pretty hard, Jill. You want to learn how to take a rest? I already 
know how to take a rest help, but I don't want to. I just want to learn some more. <laughs> well, I'm not talking about a sleeping kind of rest. I'm talking about a short pause between notes to create a melody kind of rest. This next exercise is exactly like the last exercise, except for one thing. This time, instead of playing the chord and holding it for longer counts, you're going to play them and then lift your fingers to stop the sound. You don't move your hands, you just lift your fingers like this so you're not pressing the keys anymore. Instead of each chord equaling two counts each, the chord will equal one count each and let the next count be silence. That's called a rest because you're letting your hands rest. Any questions? Do I play with both hands? Yes, you play the root note with your left hand and the chord with your right hand. We interrupt this program so you can practice playing with rests. When you're finished, hit the play button. You've been doing really well, Jill. Now it's time to have some fun. I have a great song for you. Do you like reggae music? The beat is great. Yeah, you're not the only one who feels that way. People all over the world like it too. This song has chords in it that you already know. We're just going to play it in a reggae style. That sounds like fun. So far, you've been playing notes and chords on the first beat in every measure. Well, to give this song a reggae-like feel, you're going to be playing the beats two and four. Beats one and three will have rests. So remember to lift your fingers up off the keys so that beats one and three have silence. An easy way to feel the rhythm is to tap your foot on beats one and three and play the chords on beats two and four. So why don't you play it one time through with the right hand only, then play it again with the left hand only, and then play it one more time with both hands together. You ready? Ready! There's something here I want to point out before you begin. The only time the rhythm changes is in the last measure. Play the C chord on beat two and hold it for three counts. Ready to start? Ready! One, two, three, four, 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 one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. That was great, Jill. Remember that when you play this time through, you'll be playing only with the left hand. And what you'll be playing is the root note to whatever chord you see written on the page. Ready to play with the left hand? Let's go! One, two, three, four, 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 one, two, three, four. Well done. Now try this. One, two, three, four, 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 one, two, Good. George, how about another demo? So what's different about this exercise? The rhythm seems new. That's exactly right. With his right hand, George played the chord on beat one, held it for beats two and three, and played the chord again on beat four. 
You think you can do that? Sure I can. Great. Before you do, I want to tell you about one more thing. It's called a repeat sign, and it looks like this. When you see it at the end of a line of music, it means go back to the beginning and repeat the whole song. Good work, Jill. Next, you'll play what the left hand will play when you put the two hands together. You're really getting the hang of this, Jill. Now you're gonna love this next part where you take the left hand exercise and add it to the right hand exercise. Remember that the music for the left hand isn't written. You just played the root note of the chord four times per measure. Here goes. We interrupt this program so you can practice what Jill just learned. We're almost done. I've really learned a lot of things. Let's make a list. I've learned to sit properly at the keyboard. And how the notes repeat themselves. I learned about the names of the notes on the piano. And about the difference between melody, harmony, and rhythm. I've learned how to find the beat and play notes, chords, and root notes in the left hand with both hands and I know some songs. <laughs> That's a lot to know. Now there's one more song for you to learn. It's called Rock On and you'll see that there are four sections to this song. Intro, verse, chorus, and ending. The sections are marked so you know where you are. Now you'll practice each hand alone and then put them both together. Here's some pointers for you. Play with both hands throughout the song. Sometimes both hands will be playing the same chords in unison, and sometimes the left hand will keep moving, like in the last couple of exercises. Remember that the chords are written for your right hand. At the beginning of each section, it'll tell you whether to play your left hand in unison with your right hand, or to keep your left hand moving. Practice the right and left hands separately, then try putting them together. Practice each section separately, then try putting all the sections together. In the last section, you'll have a moving left hand, except for the last chord, which will be played in unison. Any questions? Not right now. Then get playing.
Bravo! That was excellent, Jill. <laughs> Yeah! All right, Jill! Way to go! <laughs> you've done great, and you've been a great student. Couldn't have done it without your help, help. Oh, one more thing. Have you thought about when you can practice every day? I think after I get home from school, I've had something to eat and done some of my homework. Say, 4.30? That sounds like a great time. Here, I'd like you to have this. It's a practice journal. Use it to keep track of when you practice every day. Is that what you do, Help? It sure is. Here, I'll show you. Here's the time I practiced, what I did, and I like to keep notes on the songs that I played. So you don't just sit down and play the same song over and over for an hour? Well, you can if you want, but what I usually do is spend the first part of my practice reviewing old songs that I've learned as a sort of a warm-up. Then I do my technical skills like fingering or hard chords. And then I like to learn a new piece. But that's just me. Does listening to CDs count as practice? <laughs> well, I usually do that after my practice as a sort of reward for being faithful to myself. And if I've done really well, I treat myself to a live concert by a musician I really like. That's great help. Thanks for the practice journal. Say, I gotta fly. My concert starts in just a little bit. Jill, you've been great. This has been a lot of fun. Oh, I've got one other thing for you. Say goodbye to your mom for me and have her watch this videotape. There's a special message for her at the end. Thanks so much, Help. <laughs> this is so cool. Help? Mr. Rockstar? George? Hello parents and other supporters of Young Musicians. This section is just for you. The musician you care about is gonna learn many positive things from learning to play an instrument. The love of music, the value of discipline, and the confidence that comes from learning a skill one note at a time. So the question now becomes, how can you help them to master these skills? Well, here are a few tips to help. Encourage repetition. For dramatic purposes, my student progressed quickly and rather smoothly. To make significant progress, encourage your young musician to repeat and practice both the exercises and the songs as many times as they need to master them. Keep it fun. Let your musician set their own learning pace. Practice is important, but the desire to practice has to come from them. That's why I encourage all my students to set their own practice time and to write down their progress. They'll be motivated by their own desire to learn and the love of making music and you can show an interest by offering to discuss their decision with them and guiding their choice so that it's practical and realistic given the other activities in their schedule. Praise appropriately. Kids look toward caring and interested adults for positive feedback and encouragement. Instead of focusing on what they need to improve, focus on things that they're already doing right. Tell them how much you admire their good posture or the way they find the beat. Knowing how to accept sincere praise is important, and they should also know how to access it themselves. You can ask, what did you like about the way you played that exercise or song? Questions like this will encourage them to find their own strengths and to figure out their own weaknesses. Participate in the learning process. If it works for both you and the student, sit with them while they practice. Now, if they'd really rather do this on their own, let them. Just make sure they know they can come to you with any questions or problems. Have them give a home concert every now and then, so they can experiment with playing in front of others. The more fun you have together, the more motivated your child will become. Last but not least, have music in the house. And not just music you like. Expose them to as many types of music as possible. Watch concerts on TV, listen to CDs at home, or take in a live show. You might even encourage them to start their own band, because after all, experience really is the greatest teacher. Most of all, enjoy watching your young musician as they achieve something of real value, learning to play their first instrument. Well, I hope you found this information helpful. These lessons make a great starting off point, and I'd like to encourage you to check out the next step, class instruction or private instruction for your young musician. Thanks.
You make noise on percussion instruments by striking them with a stick, mallet, or your hand. Some you even shake. Percussion instruments are broken into two groups, pitched and non-pitched. Non-pitched percussion instruments keep the beat, and drums are the most popular of all non-pitched percussion instruments. Some other ways special non-pitched percussion instruments are the tambourine, triangle, maracas, and castanets. Hit it! A pitched percussion instrument can play a melody. The piano is by far the most popular of all pitched percussion instruments. Hey, this is one hot family of instruments. So much fun to play and even funner to learn. The strings add a great deal of flavor. The four main string instruments are the violin, viola, cello, and the largest of them all, the double bass. There's just nothing cooler than the bass. Some other important members of the string family are the harp, banjo, and mandolin. The guitar is one of the most popular instruments in the world. A standard acoustic guitar has six strings and is actually one of the easiest instruments to learn to play. It's the strings in a symphony orchestra that really make the music sing. Hey, did you know that the strings make up two-thirds of the orchestra? The four major brass instruments are the trumpet, the French horn, the trombone, and the tuba. The brass family is a powerful sound in most musical compositions, but also has the ability to be totally subtle and way expressive. And people look very cool playing any one of them. Woodwinds also add some serious flavor to a musical piece. The woodwinds are actually one big family divided into two groups, the flutes and the reeds. First, the flutes. Flute, piccolo, and recorder. And the reed instruments, clarinet. Saxophone. The woodwinds are one of the most diverse families of instruments. <laughs> 